I want to get us started and introduce our first slate of speakers. So to discuss cover crops and soil health today, we have a trio, Morgan Davis, Emily Waring, and Jean Eels. Morgan Davis is an assistant professor at the University of Missouri School of Natural Resources. Emily Waring is a graduate student at Iowa State in the Department of Ag and Biosystem Engineering. And Jean Eels, among other things, owns farmland and has worked extensively with other landowners to discuss their role in getting conservation practices on the ground. And she's been working with her tenants specifically to get cover crops on her farm, on her farm since 2016. So I will let Morgan and Emily unmute and get us started. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm down in Columbia, Missouri, but it was nice to see um, quite a few people from uh, the area where uh, in, in Northwest Iowa, where we are, we've been doing, Emily and I have been doing some work over the past um, uh, several years, and Emily's been up there for um, quite some time. Um, so it was, it was good to see that. Um, and so you can move on to the next slide. Thanks. So I wanted to start out with a, a bigger picture of our overall project before we dig into some of the um, specifics um, on what we found with soil health, health and uh, cover cropping. Um, and so our, our, our project at large is really looking at um, environmental losses, um, nutrient leaching and greenhouse gases, and those how those um, may be related to uh, soil health properties. Um, so we, we defined um, soil health into physical, biological, and chemical properties, which has been um, a common format um, of, of describing soil health in recent years. Um, and as you can see on this slide, uh, we hypothesize that as we add conservation practices, we should improve our soil health. And um, a perennial system we have at the site um, would be kind of the, this uh, top bar. And this really isn't a bar that, um, um, that uh, a corn soybean rotation can, can reach, but cover crops can really help it um, get there. Um, so just a couple backgrounds about the site. Emily's gonna give specifics, but um, we, um, at, at this site, we did not see any uh, yield deficits from our uh, cover crop implementation, and we did see uh, reducing, reducing um, uh, of, of nutrient uh, losses in, in nitrate leaching. Um, so, our big question that we'll be talking about today is, well, what is going on in the soil um, at some of these sites? So you can go to the next slide, please. So our overall objective was to measure these soil properties, environmental losses um, at a long-term research site. So we wanted a site that um, we didn't have to wait for this cover crop um, to see these changes in, in soil health. Um, and so we wanted to see a site that had been established for some time um, to, to look at different conservation treatments. And with that, Emily, on the next slide, will um, tell us a little bit about our site. Okay, thanks, Morgan. Um, so like you said, our site is in north central Iowa. So it's on the Des Moines Lobe and it's on Highway 3 between Humboldt and Pocahontas. So um, it started in 1989 and the goal was to monitor pesticides. So like you said, the goal of the site is to monitor water quality, but obviously cover crops are a part of that. So there are 72 plots at this site, um, which allows us to have four to eight replications of each treatment. And then up on the right there, I just have a photo of how we monitor water quantity and quality. So we use those meters and we go out there about once a week um, when the soil is not frozen. And then our main goal is looking at nitrate concentration. Um, and the five treatments that I'm presenting today are um, what we call a control, which is we assume that the average farmer doesn't have a cover crop and that they're gonna be using conventional tillage in the spring. And then our second treatment is conventional tillage with winter cereal rye. And then we have no-till and then no-till with winter cereal rye. And then um, like Morgan said, we also have a perennial up there. And the two soil health indicators we're looking at um, wet aggregate stability, which is a physical property, and then um, the 24-hour carbon dioxide burst, which is the biological property. And next slide. Um, okay, so I wanted to give some context for like the amount of above ground biomass we had, uh, because it is farther north, some people might be skeptical of if a cover crop could even grow up there. So 
Um, this graph here is winter cereal rye ahead of corn. So the x-axis goes from zero to 700 pounds per acre. Um, so that photo is showing 450 pounds per acre. So it kind of looks like an average person's lawn maybe. Um, so if you're looking at this graph, you can see that in the last four years, we had um, a large increase in kind of our success with our cover crop. And that was because um, we started hand seeding in September. So from 2011 to 2015, we were drilling after harvest. Um, so we didn't have hardly any fall growth. And then in fall of 2015, we said, okay, we'll start um, hand seeding in August. So um, you can see that made a big difference with cover crop growth. Um, okay, yep. And then here is winter cereal rye ahead of soybeans. So the axis now goes from zero to 3,000 pounds per acre. So um, there was still a big improvement in cover crop growth once we started hand seeding, but it wasn't as stark of a difference um, with, like we saw with corn. And um, I think that's just because of the later cash crop planting date for soybeans. So when we're not terminating until mid to late May, we saw um, some vigorous spring growth. Um, and then, like I said, there was um, a treatment of no-till and conventional tillage, and we didn't see a difference um, in cover crop growth with, um, depending on the tillage, we saw that cover crop was successful with both. And there's our intern Maddie standing with um, 2,000 pounds per acre. So that was about the highest that we saw. And that was in 2016. OK, and then um, I just want to show the timeline here. So the cover crop treatment started in 2010. Um, and then we switched to hand seeding in 2015. So that was when we saw um, the more vigorous growth of cover crop. And then we collected these aggregate stability samples in 2017 in the fall. So we took an intact sample of the top zero to six inches. So this was after eight years of cover crop, but some of that was kind of like a tiny amount of cover crop. Um, so that's just an FYI for some context of the timeline. And then the next slide. Um, so again, this is wet aggregate stability. There's our intern Johnny standing with our apparatus. Um, so it's a physical property and it represents soil structure, which is obviously going to be related to infiltration. And then it's just kind of measuring like the glue that you have to keep the soil together, which is going to um, represent nutrient cycling as well, which is a good thing. Um, okay, so I attempted to do some art here. <laughs> so um, the first thing we do is we soak the soil for five minutes and then next slide Liz and then we place it over three screens so or sieves um, so we have the biggest hole on top and then the medium hole and then the smallest hole so we just soaked the soil sample and then now we oscillate it for 10 minutes and um, and then we see what survived on each screen um, so which, which um, soil clumps or aggregates stayed together and kind of survived the, the wedding event. Okay, next slide. And then that brings us to our aggregate mean weighted diameter. So this is just the average, um, again, aggregate size that um, stayed on the sieve. So higher is better. So perennial um, was the best, but then it was interesting that um, we saw that tillage did not make a difference, um, but we saw that cover crop, whether it was in conventional till or no till, improved um, mean weighted diameter for aggregate stability. Next slide. All right. <clears throat> so um, I saw some questions pop up in the chat about um, hand seeding, and it does sound it. it it is exactly like, as it sounds. We physically walk the plots and seed it. And um, this is supposed to simulate, um, you know, flying over cover crop seed. Um, so if, if you're curious about that, which, which is um, becoming more, more and more common. So 
Um, okay. Um, so yeah, um, so we saw the physical change of aggregate stability with the implementation of um, cover crop and, and really no effect to our, our no-till. So we were also curious uh, biologically um, what is going on. And um, biology in the soil is always a, a tricky um, thing to measure, uh, but we can use certain indicators um, to estimate um, our biological activity. Um, and one of these is, is measuring um, carbon dioxide um, as, an, as an indicator of the soil community. Um, and, uh, and, and this also helps us look at see how well this community is, is cycling um, the residue. So if we move to the next slide. So in, in a sense, um, we all know that um, our photosynthesis is bringing CO2 from the atmosphere into our, our plant. And um, the litter from that plant, um, as it decomposes in the soil, microbes are using it for energy, nutrients, and uh, food, essentially. Um, and uh, when they do that, they respire um, similarly uh, as we do um, to humans. Um, and a lot of the CO2 that was taken in um, from photosynthesis, from the air, right, is then put back up into um, the atmosphere. So if we move to the next slide. So um, if, if you have a, a small microbial community or a less diverse microbial community, um, you may have um, less of a chance for this cycling to occur. Um, and this also could be dependent on what you're feeding those microbes. Um, it will depend on which microbes are, are gonna grow and thrive. So if, um, if you are diversifying um, the amount or the types of litter that you're putting into the soil, uh, different microbes are gonna decompose this litter differently. And so again, if you have uh, more litter, which is the case for the cover, a cover crop, um, you likely see more CO2 coming um, from this decomposition uh, when you look at a, a soil sample. And so some of you might say, whoa, more CO2, that doesn't sound good. But if we think about this, this is recent CO2 that has just been pulled from the atmosphere um, that is then being re-released in the atmosphere. And there's a chance for a small amount of that to make it into um, organic matter. And it's also housed in the microbes that are eating this food themselves. Um, next slide. So how do we measure this in the lab? Well, CO2 luckily is an easy um, thing to measure. We have good instrumentation that gives us accurate measurements and we can just do a, a soil incubation. So some of you may have heard or used um, the Solvita paddles to measure um, soil respiration um, in, a, in a mason jar with, with soil. Um, and so this is a, a, the same idea, just a little more, uh, little more high tech. So we, we measured um, CO2 production over 24 hours. Um, and this is commonly referred to as a CO2 burst. It's also part of the Haney test, which has been um, a popular test among soil health groups in, in recent years. Um, so what we did was we created an ideal environment for these soil microbes to, uh, to do their thing in the soil. And then we measured how much CO2 was produced over 24 hours. Um, and so if we move to the next slide, we can see some results. So this figure shows um, our CO2 burst um, and on our, um, on our, on our y-axis, we have um, how much CO2 was produced. So the, the units there don't really matter as much as, um, uh, is, is as we go up, we have more CO2. And then on our x-axis, we have our different, um, our, our different treatment types. Um, as, you, as you can see here, um, just visually, it, it looks like, well, um, our, our plots with rye cover crop seem to be a little higher than um, our, our, our plots without. And clearly the perennial um, is the highest. So this perennial system um, is, is, has a, is a whole bunch of different um, plants and weeds, I will say, um, in it. Some are nitrogen fixing. Um, and so it's um, it's just a system that, that hasn't been tilled. And you can see that we do see um, more of a microbial activity, but this isn't a realistic bar to necessarily um, set for cover crops because 
these systems aren't behaving in the same way. So the important thing to look is our comparisons among our other treatments here. And as I, as I said, if you just look at this figure, you're like, well, rye seems to do a little more biologically um, than, um, to, than, than no-till. Um, if we dig those, dig down a little deeper into some of the scientific statistics, um, which is over here, um, we have our, our factor, which is um, our treatment um, and, and the interaction of our treatment. Um, and the lower this number um, gets, the closer it gets to zero, uh, the better chance we have for it being significantly different in, in, in the science world. And our cover um, factor here is, is really close to that. Um, so we could uh, assume and, and show that, um, that maybe over a little more time, we would see that this, this rye is making uh, more of a difference biologically um, than our tillage or, or, or no tillage. Um, it's also very important to think about where we're at. These are very young soils. These soils have very high organic matter. And so when you're already st starting out with um, what uh, some people in, in Southern Iowa or definitely down here in Missouri would consider an excellent healthy soil, um, you, you, have to, you have to realize that you can only get so far um, biologically. But um, the great thing, and one of the things I think has been um, kind of pushed backwards um, from the idea of having cover crops is, is the protection that it provides to the soil, as well as these physical changes um, that Emily saw with aggregate stability. And so there's, there's all this talk about what's going on in the soil biologically, how does that help my soil health? Um, and I always say the worst thing biologically that could happen to soil is for that soil to end up in a ditch somewhere. So we, we always have to keep that mind in, in or that, that thought in uh, really the front of our mind when we're talk about, talking about implementing um, these practices. Um, yeah, so I think we can move to the next slide, which is just a, a thank you for our, our brief um, soil presentation. So there's a picture of Emily um, out hand seeding. Um, she's at our simulated airplane, um, and uh, which is actually was a lot of fun day to, to go out and, and do that. Um, we also had a lot of fun taking soil samples. Um, and if we go to our last slide, we just want to thank um, a number of people. Um, I did this work as a postdoc in Dr. McDaniel's lab um, in the agronomy department at Iowa State, um, and Emily is a now PhD candidate um, in, the, in the Helmers lab and none of it, Carl it, it down in the um, combine there is the guy who really gets everything done and we just kind of um, come out and, and take samples. So um, do you have anything else to add, Emily? Otherwise... Nope, right, well, I thanks. have a question so I'm not sure what the protocol is. Let's wait on you guys answering those questions and have Jean go and I'll let Jean uh, bring up her slide and then we'll have um, relay questions to you both at the end there. Sounds good. And yeah, I was gonna say, Jean, I think you need to switch. Perfect. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share my experiences this morning. I feel sometimes like kind of a novice because I haven't been on the journey all that long. And yet really in um, truth, I've been working on looking at soil health for a long time through my uh, professional work. And so I do lots and lots of meetings with women who own farmland who are not necessarily sure that they understand what the problem is and what, you know, is there a problem? What does it look like? And so I came into soil health looking at it from the um, standpoint of the slake test. And I am here to tell you that landowners can help and they just don't know what they don't know. And they're eager to learn. I have found um, that the landowners don't know what's common is not necessarily normal. So this photo of deep ruts is one of those where you, if you see it field after field after field, you assume it's normal because it's common and it isn't necessarily that case. 
So they don't always necessarily know that there's a problem on their land. They don't necessarily always realize that the problem are theirs. They assume that their tenant has the problem and it's not necessarily theirs. And they don't always realize how they can help their tenant. And so we spend a lot of time on how they can be helpful partners. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I explain my journey. So I share farmland with siblings in North Central Iowa, and the, it's about 155 acres. It's a very heavy soil, very wet in all of the yellow areas. So you see I'm dealing with um, uh, a real wet, heavy soil that has, um, <clears throat> it has tile all the way through um, back in the 19 teens, but it's also not had any livestock since 1975. And we started on our cover crop journey to start improving the soil health because we have compaction problems all across the whole farm. And so I realize now that's a result of since 1975, we've had just corn and soybeans only instead of the diverse uh, livestock and uh, pasture and small grain, et cetera. We're dealing with it with a cash rent lease. And so that makes a difference too. It was conventional tillage up until the fall of 2016. And we started with 20 with oats in the fall of 2016 on, on the whole farm just to, to get started. And I just wanted to mention that I share the land with my siblings who are great partners in all of this. We've done that since 1984. So in 2017, we had the pleasure of having to interview for a new tenant. And I can tell you as PFI folks, um, the, as soon as we heard that our tenant uh, was a PFI member, that sealed the deal for us because it was a proxy for curiosity. He wasn't a uh, cover crop user, but he was willing and interested. And we knew that PFI was, uh, I, I kidded him later that that was probably his best membership uh, amount that he's ever ever spent. So um, let me back up again. So he came into that oats cover crop. We started right away with strip till no till. Um, and he was willing to start with rye and rapeseed ahead of the, the beans and oats ahead of the corn. And so you can see our strip till there. And so in 2018, we were, I'm, I'm always interested in pushing the envelope and supporting him in any way I can to try, to try new things. So we had planned to do roller crimping in 2019 and we had uh, a fairly heavy aerial seeding, but it was thin on the edges. And since I'm dealing with compaction for sure, I wanna make sure that we get it on the end rows. So I, hi I hired a guy to drill extra basically a frost seeding of rye. So we got some root action on the end rows and in those thin areas so that our roller crimping would be a successful trial. Oh, then it was find a crimper. My tenant didn't have a crimper and we thought we had one lined up prior to planting the rye. So we were, we were planning ahead. We knew that we needed to have a roller crimper and we had it lined up before we even seeded the rye as thickly as we did. Uh-oh plans fell through over and over and over again. We thought we had it lined up here. We tried this, we tried that. We were, he and I were both working together on this and we were getting towards May and we knew he was gonna be planting soybeans. So I just bought one. So think about how your landowner can be a partner if they know what to do. And they may have options that you as a farmer may not have. So I have a, I have a roller crimper. <laughs> um, so we, we bravely went ahead and he planted um, green. This is my tenant, Nolan Patterson. He planted uh, into uh, the standing rye. And remember my goal was to A, see if we could do this and get enough residue down. So we would look towards weed control. So eventually, if we can make this work and work well, we might replace the herbicide pass. But in the first year, we did have him plant green and then we sprayed to terminate the rye just to be sure, just, just you know, to give him that extra assurance. And then we rolled it. 
And we wanted to get that mat down on the ground so that it, we would have that root action. A little unconventional goals, but it worked for us. So I was real excited this year. He was willing to do oats harvested for seed on half the farm. And uh, that gave us a longer opportunity to put in a multi-species mix. I wanted soil dynamite. I wanted root dynamite basically to help bust up the compaction in the soil. And so we, um, he, he blew out oats at the back of the combine to help with that seeding. Um, we put in buckwheat, alcite clover, which is something that I remember dad had used because it will tolerate those wet soils, those wet help uh, tight soils. Crimson clover, turnip, pearl millet, and um, a shout out again to the small grains program to help us move this forward and really help us with the clover um, part, of, part of the whole mix. So we changed the mix over and over and over. I got advice from many different people and because we were in a super dry area, uh, you know, it was just one of those things. We just had to make it work. And it was a new experience for all of us that were involved with it. Nolan was great to, to work right alongside me and we, we spent a lot of texting back and forth. We, so we have a great communication, but it was extremely hard finding services. Um, finding somebody with a drill, somebody who had experience planting that kind of a diverse mix. I threw the winter pea out of the mix because it was a big seed and I was, he and I were a little nervous about running everything through the, through the drill. So it, we were right down literally to the weekend right before we were gonna plant and trying to find somebody. And finally somebody said, well, we'll do it this time, but we're not doing it again. I don't think they had a really bad experience. I went out there and helped um, help load uh, seed and we all laughed and I brought Oreo cookies, which I don't know anybody that doesn't like Oreo cookies. So things are good. And so I look at this journey uh, as a partnership um, and really enjoy being able to take an active role in this. And I just wanna tell you, if you're playing around with cover crops and you got extra time to let them grow big, turnips are just plain fun to grow. They're just, they're just cool. Um, I don't know anybody that has gone out to my field and looked at it and said, they don't even have to like turnips, but they're all pulling up these turnips and going, wow, look at these. Um, and if I'm looking at the turnips and I'm looking at that lower part of the uh, root and you can see where it's really, really pushing hard to get through my compacted layer. So I checked the uh, nitrates in the tile outlets. We don't have uh, creek outlets, so I'm glad to use the PFI uh, bottle of nitrate test strips that were sent out. I thank you so much for those. I do this with my tenant. We know the tile uh, that we're checking. I also check the soil temperatures. Uh, again, I do it with him if he's there. And if not, I'm just going out there and checking and learning as much as I can. I take a spade out with me every time I go because I am eager to find out whether that soil is, is improving or not. And I have siblings with some mobility issues. So I'm always taking pictures, doing everything I can to get the soil in their hands. And back to when I'm talking to um, women landowners and any landowners really, is to remind them that change is a year away. You've got seed contracts that may be in place that already are committed. You've got herbicide carryover to think about if that might prevent a cover crop from being planted successfully. There are lease renewal dates that you have to be mindful of, and it is a real commitment for a year. And when it comes to women landowners, even though we've been left out a lot of times, um, they want to help. We're eager to help. We might be extra creative in how we do that, um, but as I've done 3,500 women landowners, more than a dozen states, we test and we find out that 70% of them want to take action. So don't count your landowner out if you want to go down the, on, on the next level of your path. They may be ready to go with you. Thank you. Thanks, Jean, and thanks, Morgan and Emily. Those were all 
awesome presentations. Um, we do have some questions coming in, so I'm just going to start to fire them off. Um, Jean, a first one for you talking about your cover crop expenses. So you said that you bought a roller crimper, but someone was asking if your cover crop expenses are also part of your lease or how those are split between the tenant and the landowner. Um, we have managed because it's still we're still kind of new into this. We've managed to find cost share options that either help us as the landowner or now my tenant is in the EQIP three-year program. So he's getting the benefit and he's covering some of those expenses. So we're, we're sharing that back and forth. And again, that PFI small grain um, thing really, really helped us last year because we were able to go beyond what he was able to do with EQIP. We were able to go further and we were willing to go further. Awesome. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go back to Morgan and Emily. Um, Morgan and Emily, there was some chatter in the chat box about tillage versus cover crops versus is, is having no till but cover crops versus tillage and no cover crop. Like what can we talk about some of the takeaways from your presentations with um, cover crops and tillage one or both effects on soil health? Do you, um, Emily, do you want to just talk briefly about um, the nitrate loss and no-till and, and whatnot there, and then I can use soil health there. Yeah, um, so I guess I'll say with yield, because we're like so far north, so like when thinking about, okay, do I want to implement a cover crop? Um, so like yield would obviously be a big concern and we saw big yield hits with no-till, but not with um, chisel plow this far north. So. Um, in terms of yield, cover crop was better with chisel plow. And then in terms of water quality, I'll just say cover crop was just as good with chisel plow compared to no-till. Um, and then with aggregate stability, again, cover crop was just as good with chisel plow compared to no-till. Um, yeah. Morgan, do you have yeah. anything? And, and that was for, for the soil health side of things, that was our big, um, you know, that, that kind of big idea model that I shared at the beginning is we really wanted to see stacking these practices of no-till with cover crop. Do we see a huge boost? Do we see a little boost? What, um, what, what happens? And, and so we were, we only had time today just to share a couple um, kind of tidbits behind that, but um, on a whole at, at this site, and I think that's an important to, to realize is, is where, where we're at and the type of soils. It seems, and these are also very wet soils, um, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially a pothole <laughs> for lack of a, um, so we, um, there, there's a reason it's been in research for so long. It's because uh, a lot of people in that area, I don't think wanted to farm it. So, um, but, um, so taking that into, into context, we didn't see that, that major increase of, of soil health practices by, by, by stacking these two. But that's not to say that um, others researching in other parts of, of the country or Iowa haven't seen um, uh, um, those, um, those improvements. So I, uh, there are a number of studies that show um, that, that CO2 burst um, metric that we showed today of no-till actually being able to, to increase um, that biological measure as well. Uh, we, just, we just didn't, um, we didn't necessarily see it at, at this site. Um, if you were farming at this site, the more bang for your buck would be cover crops. Um, but but that's, uh, you know, that's the interesting thing about all these conservation practices is there's so much data out there now that people have been collecting, farmers have been collecting, research has been collecting, that um, you can kind of start to hone in on, well, what are my soils? Are they similar to what this, you know, this study is actually looking at? Um, and I think it's an important thing to, to keep in, in, in mind um, when, when deciding um, you know, financially which road to go down. Thank you both. Um, and just while I have you both, uh, there were some technical questions about like seeding rates and whether when you're hand seeding, you've been able to go in earlier, which accounts for some of the higher biomass. Is could, or Would you be able to clarify any of the like drill seeding rates versus the hand seeding rates and, and the timing on that for folks? Yeah, so we drilled at 90 pounds per acre and we 
um, hand seeded at 90 pounds per acre. So the, the um, amount was the same, the rate was the same, but with drilling, we couldn't get in until after the crop was out. So it was like late October, early November. And then um, with hand seeding, we get in like very early September around Labor Day. So that is why there was so much more growth because um, once we started hand seeding, then we actually saw growth in the fall rather than just going dormant and nothing happening until spring. Great. Hey, Jean, another question for you. Um, we're, we're curious if your tenant is working with other landowners and if what you're doing with them is impacting what they're doing on maybe their other farms or how sort of that moves outward to more people. It, it's been an amazing thing because I, once we started on our farm, um, he immediately did that on other farms. And so he, it impacted all the rest of his acres with the exception of one landowner who isn't particularly interested in the uh, no-till strip till uh, combination. But um, yeah, and I should say that our former tenant was a, a good tenant and he's just simply retired. We didn't scare him off with the cover crops. However, mm, he had to give up a little bit of tillage time in the fall. And I don't think he missed that on his last year of uh, farming. So um, that was one thing I forgot to mention. Great. And a question for all three of you, if farmers want to do some of these tests on their own. So Jean, you mentioned the slick test and Emily, you talked about measuring um, aggregate stability. Do they need to be using like special distilled water or can they just use well water from their own property? If you do it informally, like I do with the uh, mason jars and some turkey netting and a rubber band, I just use whatever water I can find because it, it functions uh, just fine to be able to see whether it's going to hold together or dissolve. And it is such an eye opener. Um, I encourage people to try it. I'm always gathering soil from my farm, different parts of the farm, and I'm plunking it in water to see what I can do, um, you know, see if it's changing. We use distilled water, but um, NRCS has a nice, like they call it the soil health bucket, I think. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, that's great for um, kind of on-farm stuff. So great. Distilled water. Yeah. Okay, thank you all. 